Hence, Shifter's Forever Worlds Book 23, by L. Thorne. Chapter 1 Mackenzie Clarity, Mac to anyone who knew her, stood at the counter in the front office of the Bear Canyon Wildlife Reserve Vet Clinic. She was putting together the order for next week. A disturbance hit her body with the same intensity of a storm brewing. She knew. Right away. Lance. She'd felt him enter the valley. That damned bear shifter was back. Did he look the same? Had he changed? Those dark blue eyes almost the color of midnight, that chiseled face so characteristic of the Del Cruz brothers. Lance. The middle brother. The heartbreaker. The destroyer of souls. And yet, though he'd destroyed and utterly devastated her when he left four years ago, here she was. Still standing. Still alive. At least on the outside. On the inside she'd been an iceberg, working, taking care of the animals. On the inside, she'd been shredded as if her heart had been shoved into a wood chipper. The air felt like it was full of electricity and ready to crack with any disturbance. Or maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm going to crack. She kept her eyes on the paperwork in front of her. Her phone buzzed. A text. From her new best friend Ariadne, though it felt like she'd known Ariadne forever. Best friend or not, she'd never discussed Lance with Ariadne. She wasn't sure she could say his name out loud. Not without reliving the agony. The side of her neck burned with more ferocity than the usual persistent dull throb. Another sign he was here. Fury flew through her. That damned thing was supposed to have been taken care of. Fucking witch doctor. Took her money, but failed to deliver. She glanced at the text from Ariadne, inviting her to come up for dinner and to check on Buck. Buck was a fawn that Cross had brought down to Mac to check on. The little deer's mother had been shot, and the tiny creature had been in a state of shock when Cross brought him down the mountain for her to treat. Now the little deer, Cross had named him Buck to Ariadne's amusement, wouldn't leave Cross's side. It behaved like a puppy following him or Ariadne all around, going hiking with them when Cross took Ariadne exploring on the mountain. Mac was glad Cross found someone. Just because Mac hated Cross's brother Lance didn't mean she'd feel the same way about Cross. And she really liked Ariadne, the woman he'd saved from the mob's hitmen less than a month ago. Interesting how seamless Ariadne's entrance had been into Cross's life. The two fit together as if they'd always been that way. Anger seared through Mac's veins. She and Lance had never had that. Never that ease, that peaceful coming together. Nope. She and Lance were passion-fueled by kerosene. No sweet lovemaking for the two of them. It had always been fierce, formidable and always unforgettable. She exhaled in fury, her body sucker-punched by the thought of their sexual history. Her awareness of their chemistry created a throb, after all these years, after all that heartbreak. She remembered the intense hunger in his nighttime blue eyes, the way his bear had flamed golden amber in the depths of Lance's gaze. The reserve, the office, the low hum of the computers, the sound of the radio, it all melted away as her pulse resonated in her mind, her heart, and some places south of her navel. Fuck. Fuck this. She shoved Lance out of her mind, shoved the visage of their love and their desire far away and picked up her cell and her car keys. Deal, Mac. Just deal. She pep-talked herself because what the fuck else was she to do? Chapter 2 Lance Del Cruz was going home. Finally. He punched it, flooring the pedal, though his old pickup truck wasn't going to give him much more speed. She wasn't built for speed. She was built for reliability and work. And his truck was good at both. He'd kept her stored in the city, at a rental unit, paying a year in advance. He didn't get to drive her much, his job didn't offer too many vacations or holidays. And when it did, they were rarely planned. She waited for him, in the storage unit by the airport, for those rare times when he came home. He had enough supplies in the storage unit to do any repairs needed, while she languished in the unit, unmaintained. Just a charge this time, 
and she picked up reliably, roaring to life, ready to take him home. Home. Lance looked at the horizon, picked out the peaks of the Bear Canyon mountain range. There was Cross's, Crag's Peak. Next in line was his own, Devil's Horn. Funny how it all worked out. In their younger days, there'd been three brothers and three peaks. Now, each of the three had their own peak. And each brother had picked his own without there ever being a squabble. Too bad all things that were meant to be didn't happen quite so seamlessly. He rolled his window down, inhaling, letting his bear savor the scent of home. It hadn't always been home to the Del Cruz brothers. They'd been little when they were dropped off on May Forrester's doorstep. They had stridden outside, taken one look at the raggedy, underdressed, underfed, and definitely unkempt boys, and done the one thing Lance hadn't expected. She'd opened her arms and wrapped them in a hug. Welcome home, she'd said. And home it was. Bear Canyon Valley. May had become their aunt, though more like a foster mother. The beautiful, widowed brunette had opened her heart and home. To many, it seemed as her home was always teeming with shifters, kids and adults, orphaned, injured, starving, you name it. Lance breathed in deeply again. God, he'd missed the scent of this place. No other place on earth smelled like Bear Canyon Valley. Home. Cross was probably already home. He joined the Shifter Council Compliance Unit before Lance did. Shifter Council Compliance Unit. SCCU, for short. Those who were a part of the unit were called enforcers. And they weren't loved by all. Especially not the wrongdoers. If the Shifter Council convened and determined an individual had done wrong or needed to be punished, the enforcers were brought in to do the punishing. Yeah. Lance went in a little after Cross did four years ago. Okay, okay, truth was, after his big brother left Bear Canyon, Lance couldn't stay. It wasn't because he and Cross were all that close. Nah, it was more like he didn't want to miss out on all the fun he knew Cross would be having. Fun. Hardly. A life of killing and capturing rovers, murderous shifters, and douchebags. When he first signed up, Lance hadn't understood the terms of being an enforcer. Four years of service. One year off. Paid. Who the hell could resist that? It was a gift. Only he'd been wrong. The time off was going to be very necessary. A man or a shifter couldn't go through this much time of tracking, hunting, and sometimes killing without losing a piece of his soul day in, day out. So without a doubt, this year's hiatus would be very welcome. Another deep breath. A left turn. The road curved to the right. Bear Canyon Valley, the sign read. He should have veered to the left, taken the seldom-traveled road up to the mountains, then turned right toward Devil's Horn. But he didn't. He couldn't. He wouldn't feel right going home without stopping by May's house for at least a quick hello. And maybe she had some of that apple pie laying around. He'd miss that. He glanced at the clock on the dash. Yeah, she'd be home by now. Lance turned off the main road, drove a few miles down, then pulled into the driveway. His stomach grumbled in anticipation. Whatever she had on the stove, he knew it'd be good. And he was damned hungry. Lance leapt from the truck, his nose picking up the scent of pot roast vegetables and... He took another deep breath while snatching plenty of real estate with long strides. Apple pie. He froze, a grin stretched across his face. The inside door was open. Nothing but the screen door stood between him and what was cooking inside. A large form appeared. Lance braced, ready to kick the door in on top of the mountain of a guy on the other side. Lance? The silhouette asked. Lance paused pushing down his instinct to defend himself and inflict harm. Doc. Jake Doc Evans. The valley's doctor, who doubled as a shifter doctor. Lance remembered Doc. He and his wife used to live in the valley with their daughter Astra. Actually, she was Doc's stepdaughter. Then Lance remembered the day Doc's wife was killed. Not long after that, he'd moved away. Seems now he was back. Or of visiting. Doc pulled the door open. Come on in. He extended his hand. Man, haven't seen you in years. 
Heard you were with the SCCU. Lance nodded. It wasn't common to discuss working in that field. Most enforcers kept their work on the down low. Kept the enemy count down. Good to see you. He shook Doc's hand. They around? He made a point of sniffing. It smells like she is. Doc laughed. She went upstairs to change. Gravy splashed on her top. He pointed to the table. Casserole dishes covered with foil, a pie plate, and an assortment of containers sat next to an oversized basket. We were just heading over to Astra and Kane's. Astra. Doc's daughter. Kane. Who was that? And then it clicked for Lance. The way he'd said we were just heading over. We. I missed something. We. Well, damn. It didn't occur to me she hadn't told you. I'm guessing maybe you two haven't talked in the last few months. Lance shook his head, guilt setting in. I've been out of touch. Assignment and stuff. Not that out of touch, he reprimanded himself. Sure the assignment had put him out of contact, but he'd been back for a while. Doc shifted weight from one foot to the other. Well, so may. That was when Lance picked it up. The bond. They'd couple bonded, the way shifters do when they mate, bonding for life forever. I'm sorry. Lance felt dense. I should have noticed. He really should have picked up the aura. Congratulations. It's no problem. I'm sure your job keeps you busy. That, and I still find it hard to talk to anyone in Bear Canyon Valley. It still reminded him of her. Reminders he didn't need. It's not like he didn't already have enough reminders. The sky on a stunning spring morning brought to mind her eyes. The glimpse of a head with blonde hair the same shade as hers made him do a double take, looking for her, missing her, needing her. Every blonde head that reminded him of her wasn't her. It was some other woman. A woman who could never measure up to the woman he knew was the only one for him. A warm summer's breeze would remind him of her breath, hot and seeking when she took him in her mouth, her tongue tracing the rim of his cock. Lance clenched his teeth. He had to get her out of his mind. Out of his system. I think I came to the wrong place to do that. No, he could do it. He could avoid her. He would do it. He'd hole up in his cabin on Devil's Horn. He had more than enough provisions in the back of his truck to last him a long, long time. He wouldn't have to come down off the mountain. Maybe he'd go see Cross. He'd missed his brother, though they didn't get along. Okay, that's not exactly accurate. Cross's bear and Lance's bear didn't get along, making it difficult to hang out. That sums it up. Hard to visit with someone when you've got an angry grizzly bellowing in your head. Lance? May threw her arms around him. Lance hugged her tightly, inhaling the scent of her. May's scent was like coming home, like warm apple pie, hot cocoa, stories by the fireside. May's scent was a bomb to an orphaned, homeless bear cub of a shifter. Aunt May. His lips curled into a smile. How's my favorite nephew? She leaned back, holding him at arm's length. I swear, Lance. Who would have thought you'd be such a handsome man? I bet the ladies in the city can't get enough of you. He shrugged. Ladies? Yeah, right. He avoided all females. He'd had and lost the best thing, the only thing he'd ever wanted. You two get caught up. May slipped away from Lance and into Doc's arms. Sure did. Congratulations. Lance was genuinely happy May had someone now. He'd watched her living a lonely existence, even though her life was full of the shifters she'd given a home to. And Doc had always seemed a good one. Looks like you two are heading out. I only stopped by to say hi. Don't mean to hold you up. Just going to Kane and Astra's. You remember Astra. May didn't wait for him to answer. Why don't you join us? Have you eaten? Are you hungry? She speared him with a barrage of questions. Lance laughed. No. I'm fine. Then his damned stomach had to go off and rumble in protest. May laughed. 
A smile crept to Doc's face. You sure? You'd be welcome. I've got supplies in the truck. I'm good. Nonsense. May stomped her foot. You're going with us. If you can't stay long, at least stick around long enough to make a plate to take with you. Astra's been practicing with some new recipes. She'll love having another guinea pig to test them on. Looks like you have enough food right here. Everybody's bringing something. Lance froze. The smile vanished from his face. Everybody. Yeah, T, Kelsey, Tanner, and Marty. Doc glanced at May. That's everyone, isn't it? As far as I know. Unless they got a hold of Cross and Ariadne. Ariadne. Seems I need to talk to my brother. He didn't tell me he was involved. May appraised him with a knowing eye. Still, she knew about Lance's and Cross's bears. Hell, when they were little, their bears had taken over and damn near killed each other in a fight. He gave her a nod. Still, May frowned. I've never seen anything like that, not to this degree and not with siblings. Chapter 3 Mac pulled up in front of Cross's cabin at the top of Crag's Peak in the Bear Canyon mountain range. She opened the jeep's door. Buck stood next to the front porch. His ears twitched when she called his name. Walking toward Mac, Buck's tail flicked wildly. He wasn't a dog, and it wasn't like a dog wagging his tail, but there was something about the way the little deer did it that made her think he was glad to see her. Hey there. She leaned down, touching his soft fur. You're doing well. He was. The little deer was flourishing. Mac? Ariadne flew out the cabin's front door, took the few stairs in one leap and wrapped her arms around Mac. Good to see you. Stir crazy? Missing people? What gives? Mac laughed. No. Just? A blush crept to Ariadne's cheeks. Will it sound crazy if I say you're the closest thing to a sister, to family, except for Cross? Sadness crossed her face. Mac knew the story. The same thugs who tried to kill Ariadne had killed her father, leaving her without family. No, it's not crazy at all. You've become like a sister to me. And she had. Mac didn't have siblings. She had a mother who traveled the globe with her millionaire husband, spending tons of money on procedures and products, forever trying to give the impression she was decades younger. It's not as though mom wants a constant reminder, she has a daughter the same age as she's trying to appear. And Mac had a father too, somewhere in one of the federal prisons that doubled as a country club. But he'd never really been her father. He'd cut out of her life before Mac could walk. Totally like a sister. She hugged Ariadne with a tight squeeze. What am I missing out on? Cross laughed as he approached. Mac's heart skipped a beat, like it did every time she saw Cross. He reminded her of Lance way too much. On the outside, anyway. Lance was far more intense and far more dangerous. Rebellious too. A maverick. She was surprised he hadn't ended up in front of the shifter council, with charges brought against him for his reckless ways. But no, he'd gone and followed his brother's footsteps, joining the compliance unit, sent out to take care of those who were breaking shifter law and code. And he'd left her behind. After he'd couple bonded with her. After he'd marked her as his for life. After he'd given her the ability to heal quickly, like a shifter. Except, she wasn't a shifter. She was marked as his mate. Forever. Or so she thought. Until she found out about the witch doctor. Maybe the joke's on me. He's back in the valley, and I can feel him. The witch doctor said, I wouldn't be able to. Does that mean I'm still bonded to him? That he's still bonded to me? Bonded to the man I hate. Just fucking great. Maybe it was time to pay that damned snake oil salesman of a witch doctor a visit. At the very least, I'm due a refund. Or maybe it was supposed to be like vaccinations. You needed a booster every so often. Either way, I spent $500 to be free of him and I'm not. Mac? 
Ariadne's hand was on Max's shoulder, her eyes filled with concern. Yeah. Are you okay? You look like you were a million miles away. I wish. Her body pulsed. God did she ever wish. They talked Mac into it. God knows, when the last thing Mac wanted to do was be around people, somehow Ariadne and Cross had talked her into going to Astra and Kane's for dinner. You can't be a hermit forever, Ariadne told her. Wanna bet? I can give it a good run for its money. But she didn't want to disappoint Ariadne. And though Ariadne said she'd become close to the other shifters' mates in the valley, Mac could tell she was closer to her. She plastered a smile on her face as she stood behind Cross and Ariadne, in front of Astra and Kane's cabin at the top of one of the mountains that hugged Bear Canyon Valley. Mac had met Astra and Kane, though she couldn't say she'd hung out with them much. Can't say I've done that with anyone. True. Since she and Lance split up, she dedicated herself to the Bear Canyon Wildlife Reserve. She'd spent more time traveling the region, seeing to injured wildlife and their rehabilitation, than she did in her modest little cottage. Assistants covered the clinic and the reserve while she traveled. More often than not, these days, it seemed Mac was being called to places outside the region. Even outside the state. Twice, she'd actually visited South America to assist with a case. She had a passion for helping wildlife, and a passion for getting away from the valley and the reminders of her time with Lance. The front door opened. Astra, with her stunning glowing eyes and spun gold hair, squealed with delight. You made it. And you've brought Mac. She hugged Ariadne, then hugged Mac. Mac yielded to the hug, though she wasn't really the huggy type. Sure you have enough food? Cross laughed. I brought my appetite, and my bear's appetite too. No worries. Astra opened the door wider. May and Doc are on their way over. And you know how much May cooks. Mac knew too. She'd gotten to know May well since May had raised Lance and his brothers. It was only natural, May was a part of her relationship with Lance. A surge of guilt traveled through Mac. She'd avoided May a lot. It was simply too difficult to be around a constant reminder of Lance. Plus, after their breakup, then Lance moving away to work with the compliance unit, May had stopped in often to check on her to see if there was a chance they'd get back together, insisting Mac and Lance were faded mates and all that other garbage. If we were so damned faded, he wouldn't have walked out on me. Especially not after couple bonding. Especially that, it had ruined her ability to think of another man. Ever. Mac kept the smile plastered to her face, though she wanted to grimace at the idea of seeing May and thinking of Lance. As if he ever leaves my mind for long anyway. Inside the cabin, a small cabin at that, though Kane had already begun to build an addition onto the back, the brothers Teague and Tanner, also taken in by May for a time during their younger years, were there with their mates Kelsey and Marty. Missing was Marty's son, Dominic, a young polar bear shifter. Mac enjoyed the spirited little tyke's sense of humor. Where's Dom? Sleepover, Marty said with a smile. Date night, Tanner added, waggling his eyebrows suggestively. Marty gave him a playful smack on the arm. Quit that. May and Doc were noticeably absent. Let's start. We've got appetizers. Astra said with a sing-song in her voice, clearly excited. Astra's been practicing with puff pastries, Kane expanded. They sampled Astra's crab puffs, damn good. As far as Mac was concerned, she'd be Astra's guinea pig any day of the week. The buzzing sensation she knew was Lance's connection to her hadn't waned all day, but now. Holy buckets! The buzzing turned to an electrical charge, coursing its way through her body. No. Hell no. Say it isn't so. A knock sounded on the door. It is so. She didn't need anyone to tell her Lance was outside the door. Sweat broke out on her forehead and her upper lip. Not the sexy kind that was tiny drops, she knew it was the ugly kind of I just worked out like an MMA fighter kind. Fuck. She grabbed a napkin and dabbed. Quit this. Quit this now. 
as if chastising and scolding herself would yield the results she wanted. Kane opened the door. The air was sucked out of the cabin and out of her lungs. Everything began to spin, the room tilted. Chapter 4 Lance stood outside the front door of Kane and Astra's cabin with May and Doc. He breathed deeply, sucking oxygen in, willing himself, his heart, his bear, and his soul to settle down. To not react. Lance knew. He'd have liked to not have known. He'd have liked to not have felt. He'd have liked to. Who the fuck am I kidding? The only thing I'd like is to have my fucking mate back. Mackenzie Clarity. She was inside the cabin. He could sense it. He'd seen a jeep just like hers when they'd first pulled up, but he wasn't sure. Now he was. His nerves were on fire with the awareness of her. He wondered if she'd been in the valley when he'd first come in. Their bond, it wasn't as strong as it used to be. Has she found someone else? Is that why I'm not feeling her as intensely as I used to? Once upon a time, long ago, before he fucked everything up by walking away from her, he could feel her from miles and miles away. Hell, the very day he left, he'd felt their connection even as his old faithful truck carried him out of the valley and onto the life course he'd chosen. The Shifter Council's compliance unit recommended enforcers be unattached, unmated. He'd lied on his application. He never got caught. He'd said he wasn't couple-bonded. Would telling the truth have gotten him barred? He hadn't wanted to find out. Cross had joined. Lance followed. Or so everyone thought. They hadn't realized Lance had an agenda. He wanted to access their records. He wanted to know if the ones who killed his parents had been punished. If they hadn't, he wanted to do the punishing himself. What? May had asked something something he completely missed because he almost couldn't hear anything due to the sound of the ocean's tide filling his head. His bear roared, trying to compete with the tidal wave in his mind. She was here. Deal with it, moron, he told himself. As if he could. As if he could glance at another woman. Think of another woman. Hell, even be with another woman. His cock swelled because of Mac. And years of no Mac. And simply because, Mac. He smiled at May and caught the expression in his foster mother's eyes. It wasn't pity. Pity would have been kind. It was a soul-wrenching sadness. Aunt May gets it. Of course she would. She lost Brad, her first mate. Look how many years it took for her to take another mate. I'm fine, Lance said gruffly, giving her a hug. He knocked on the door louder than he should have, with more ferocity than he'd planned. Blame it on the bear. Kane opened the door. The aroma of crab and baked goods whooshed out of the room. It went completely ignored by Lance. There was one scent, and one scent alone that stuck to him with more tenacity than the fiercest adhesive known. He assessed the room swiftly, his eyes instantly drawing a bead on her face. My Mackenzie. Her eyes, the blue of the Caribbean sky on the very best of days, were locked on him. The intensity of her gaze was ferocious. He noticed her hair. The long blonde mass she used to have was a shorter bob, barely touched her shoulders. And damn sexy, that hairstyle. He squared his shoulders, deliberately avoided looking at her mouth. He couldn't handle seeing the lips that used to curve into a stunning smile, with innocent glee. He couldn't handle the same lips that tilted into a seductress's pout just before she'd take him into her hot mouth and then take him to places he never thought existed. Places that resulted in ecstasy and groans of release. Yeah, need to stay away from that mouth. Same high cheekbones full, same strong jaw. Same defined eyebrows that express more emotion than some people's entire face. He was back. He'd been gone for four years, but now he had a year to consider re-enlisting. Except there was nothing to reconsider, not really. He knew what he wanted. Completely. Totally. Forever. Except there was one problem. The expression in her eyes said no chance in hell. He stepped in, operating on autopilot, 
following May and Doc into Kane and Astra's cabin. Lance deliberately pushed his focus away from Mac. He had to. It was that or become transparent and let everyone read his emotions. Astra hadn't changed much. Same eerie eyes. Same light blonde hair. Same quirky smile. Except now she was a woman, not the little girl he'd remembered before Doc took her to Florida to raise after her mother was killed. Lance? Astra gave him a hug. You haven't changed. You either. Nice to see you happy. And it was good to see a smile on her face. Good to see her with a mate who clearly cherished her. Poor Astra, losing her mother, going through a depression, Doc having to move her away from the memories and the pain, and even the danger, perhaps. Lance never had found out what was behind the attack on Astra's mother. He was introduced to a couple of grisly shifters and their mates. Teague, Tanner, Kelsey, and Marty. Lance had heard of the shifters. They were two more of May's nephews. He glanced at his Aunt May. The woman was incredible. Too bad she never had kids of her own. Or maybe this was why she hadn't. Perhaps some grand design made it so she could be the foster mother she was. May was giving Cross a hug. Cross. Lance would need to face this as well. Here we go. He took a step closer. Hey, brother, he greeted his older sibling. Lance. Cross's smile was strained. How are things? Lance knew why his brother's face looked like he'd just taken a sip of unsweetened lemonade, because he was sure Cross was going through the same thing Lance was. For some damned reason, their bears hated each other with such passion that the roaring and snarling in their heads was overwhelming, often drowning outside noises. Lance put his hand out to Cross, ignoring his bear's bristling, growly protests. Cross grabbed his hand, but instead of shaking it, he pulled him into a hug. It's good to see you, regardless of this. This. The bears. The hatred. The enmity. The competition. Yes, it is, Lance agreed, ignoring his bear. May put her hand on each of their shoulders. You're both home for a year. Can we figure this out? It's not healthy. It sure as hell hadn't been healthy. The two brothers had nearly killed each other when they were younger and shifted into their bears. Though both of them were in the Shifter Council Compliance Unit, they didn't work anywhere near each other. Oh, at first the unit commanders had tried to put them together in the same squad, thinking brothers would be good together, and of course, like everyone else, they'd assumed Lance was following in his big brother Cross's footsteps. He and Cross had been adamant about the fact they would not work together. Period. And they hadn't. For years, they hadn't seen each other. They texted once or twice during the holidays or birthdays. Nothing more. No emails. No calls. No, where are you working this week, bro? None of that. Chapter 5 So much for Lance's effect on Mac having diminished. Mac felt him, and the effect on her body was bad. Very bad. Then she saw him, and bad was redefined. With one glance, her defenses, her fortifications, her everything and her anything were shattered, splintered into a million damned pieces that left her soul in bleeding slivers. She braced herself, closed her eyes to keep the pain from being broadcast, and summoned a strength she hadn't known she possessed to keep the pain from owning her. She opened her eyes, stared at Lance Del Cruz with the intensity of a laser beam. She kept her essence unapproachable, and her gaze hostile. He hadn't changed. The penetrating midnight blue eyes that could cut through her with the ease of a scalpel or render her into a wet, wanton woman looked back at her. His jaw muscles clenched and a tick plagued his temple. Lance. He really was back in Bear Canyon. Just not back in her bed, which he never should have left. And not exactly back in her heart and mind, which he'd never left. Not really. He didn't leave her mind at all, and her heart couldn't purge him, even with the ministrations of that damned witch doctor. This merited a trip back, indeed. Why did it feel like her reaction to him was stronger than ever? He didn't take his eyes off her face. 
she couldn't take her eyes off his. The yearning. His hunger. That was on naked display for her, right there, reflected in the amber glow of his bear's presence in the depths of Lance's eyes. His bear wanted her. His bear wanted them. It's the man who didn't want me. And she wasn't willing to have the bear, if she couldn't have the man. Hell she couldn't. How could she? Lance had walked away from what they shared. She didn't. The broad shoulders, maybe even broader now. The wide chest, the way she remembered it catching the sunlight in the early morning hours when they'd lie in bed together, and she'd wake before he did, studying this vision of perfection, basking in the glow of his love. The dark hair sprinkling his forearms, emphasizing the muscles and tendons when he was working outside. Fuck, I need to shake myself from this train of thought. Weather. Someone was talking to her. Mac turned her head slowly to Kelsey, who was talking to her evidently, though Mac had been in another dimension, another plane, another planet. I'm sorry? She tore her eyes from Lance and paid attention to Kelsey. Or at least she tried to. There's weather coming. They called for an unexpected spring blizzard. I guess they're expecting it though. Kelsey laughed at her own joke. Maybe they didn't expect it to be as bad as it's supposed to be. Make sure someone follows you down the mountain. Mac nodded. Smiled. Took a bite of crab puff to keep her hands and mouth busy. The previously delicious puff was now flavorless, and the conversations around her faded to nothing as she remembered their last day together. She'd had no idea it was coming. None at all. Back then. Late on a Saturday, Mac was getting ready to lock up the clinic when Lance walked in. Is everything okay? He didn't normally come by the clinic without a sick or injured animal. His bear's desire flamed an amber glow deep in Lance's indigo eyes. It's better than okay. He leaned in, his lips taking hers, bruising and claiming them. Fingers cupping her cheek, he moved lower to her jawline. His tongue pressed her resistance away, owning her mouth, twining with her tongue. His lips scorched hers the same way his soul sought hers, wanting back their relationship. His kiss delivered a message her ears would never believe, thanks to the abandonment she'd suffered, first from her parents and then him. Fuck it, he groaned softly against her mouth. Her pulse raced. The throb in his body was overwhelming, like it was attached to her brain, because she couldn't stop the primal beat from filling her mind. She sucked in a deep breath which thrust her breasts forward. Her peaked nipples poked at the white material of her dress, their outline tattling her arousal. She didn't care. This was the man she loved. The only man for her. Lance tugged on her top, the fabric gave, revealing a bra that barely held her creamy pebble-tipped mounds. Her chest pumped for breath. He shoved her bra down, straps over her shoulders, and lowered his head to suck one nipple. He latched on, taking it in deeply then releasing it with a pop. His fingers reached for her other nipple, tweaking and tugging on it, rolling it between fingertips while it grew stiffer and stiffer, sending jolt after jolt between her nipples and clit. Her chest hurt, burning with a need to breathe, reminding her she was holding her breath. His lips on her breast, his hand on her other breast were overwhelming, but they did nothing to satisfy the aching, pulsing desire between her legs. When he bit down on her nipple, she almost came undone. Her hands flew down to her waistband, alternating between hips until her shorts were low enough to shimmy off. She lowered one hand between her legs. Lance's brows raised and desire flashed in his eyes. Slipping a finger between her folds, she found the wetness he'd created had already drenched her. Her fingers didn't stop even though he was watching, if anything seeing naked lust on his face fueled her. He pulled on her nipples with both hands while he watched her touching herself. Work that pussy. The way he said it made her inner muscles clench, and her fingers moved faster and faster in tight circles on the tiny center of her desire. I want to watch you fuck yourself, he whispered in her ear. Now. Oh God, she gasped, panting and tormented with pleasure. She wanted him. Did she ever. The way he turned her on and left her needing him made her want to do the dirtiest things to herself while he enjoyed watching. Now. Lance brushed his lips across her nipple, 
His scruffiness teased her sensitive flesh, lighting it further on fire, as she imagined that beard between her legs licking the area she'd shaved clean. She shoved a finger in and closed her eyes. A gasp, followed by an exhaled breath escaped her. She moved her finger in and out. That's it Mac. Touch yourself the way you want me to. His breath was hot on her nipple, then she felt it traveling lower. She held her breath captive while his tongue made a slow slick trail over her stomach. She sucked it in, almost self-conscious. She pushed her finger in, then pulled it out. In, out. Put another finger in, he groaned against her skin. She did, enjoying the filling sensation. His hot tongue separated her folds and touched her clit. She jumped. His tongue swiped at her clit faster, harder, faster. He switched to sucking. Then he licked more. He pushed her legs wider. She leaned against the counter. She pulled her fingers out, holding his head in place. Lance slid his fingers inside, two, then a third, widening her, driving deeply, then curling upward while his tongue tormented her with its persistent licking, sucking and flicking. Max's legs shook, slowly losing the good fight. When he removed his fingers and slipped his tongue into her, pulling out her moisture, licking her and sucking her lips in then letting them out with a loud smacking pop, she bit down on her lip to keep from crying out. His whole face beard scratching and tickling rubbed on her folds. Her hands were unstoppable, digging into his hair, pulling at it, pushing him closer. His fingers quickened their pace, matched by her breathing and leg shaking. Oh God. Lance. Oh. My. God. She climaxed, falling apart. His groan pushed her further, and another spasm began and she came undone again. Wave after wave, she rode to a new place, one she'd never been before. His lips slick with her moisture, his beard glistening with her essence, Lance kissed her, letting her savor what he'd done for her. He licked his lips, his eyes flaming amber gold, his face a mask of pure desire. He dropped his pants. Mac reached out, touching the hotness, the hardness. Holding him in her grip, squeezing him. He raised a hand to her breasts, pushing them together, watching her while his tongue traveled from one nipple to the other, spanning the short distance quickly. Then he lowered his head, letting her breasts caress his cheeks, the beard scratching her tender flesh. She moved her hand forward and backward. Damn. Lance growled. With one swift plunge he drove into her, her body stretching to take him in, gripping him tightly. He pulled back then pushed in deeper. Mac gasped from the deepness, arching her back forward, trying to get even more of him, finding pleasure in the pain of having his largeness so far inside. She closed her eyes and relished every thrust, every plunge, every drive. When he stopped, her eyes flew open. The golden amber glow in his gaze was intense. She realized she was looking right into his bear's heart. Lance roared driving deeper, pulling her close, baring his teeth, driving his mouth into her neck. Heat from his climax shot deep inside her. An orgasm ripped through her body. He held her tightly while her body spasmed with aftershocks. Only a few hours after they'd made love, everything had fallen apart. Max sat in the bedroom of her cottage, which Lance had moved into, in front of the computer, monitoring some remote cameras the reserve had set up on the mountaintops. Lance walked in. I have to go. And Mac, completely in the dark as to what he was talking about, assumed he meant the grocery store. Or maze. Or something. Until he pulled out his suitcase. Perplexed, she stared at him. Suitcase. For? She couldn't come up with an answer. Where are you going? I have to leave. And his face was chiseled from granite. I can't have you waiting for me. Anger seeped into Mac's pores. What does that mean? He shook his head, the only thing that could be remotely considered a response. They'd couple bonded a year earlier. They were mates. She'd accepted his bear, accepted the shifter lifestyle, accepted the shifter responsibilities and accountability. But this. This went against shifter accountability. Against her personal beliefs. And she thought it went against Lance's principles. So that's it? That's all you have to say. I love you. And he left. Got in his old truck. And left. Just like that. 
and took everything that mattered to Mac with him. Just like her father walked out without a word or a care, so did Lance. He's no better than my mother, who'd taken the first chance she had to send Mac away to school. As if I were a troubled child. Or a delinquent. Her father abandoned her. Her mother shipped her off. No wonder I don't trust anything but animals. When she'd first met Lance, she'd kept him at arm's length. She didn't trust people, she believed they would let her down. They already had. Then she dropped her defenses and let Lance in. It started with a wolf. Chapter 6 Way back when, it started with a wolf. Mac had been relatively new at the clinic. Every Saturday, a different person had to work the desk. Wouldn't you know it, this was her Saturday. She'd shut down the computer then reflected on a quiet afternoon hiking with her Belgian sheepdog, some reading afterward, and enjoying the cottage she'd moved into less than a month ago. The door flew open. He'd blocked the sunlight, this large man standing in the doorway. Deep blue eyes probed into her very soul, seeing her for who she was. The widest shoulders and thickest chest she'd ever seen on a man. She surveyed his chest, then her focus drew downward to the V it created as it merged with his hips. And right there in the midst of all that sex-on-a-stick hotness, a limp wolf. The brownish-gray creature lay lifeless in his arms. Except it hadn't been dead. She led the man holding the wolf into one of the examination rooms. Taking care of animals, that was her thing. She'd forgotten to put her walls up while she was tending to the wolf. She'd let her guard go and with it, her heart. Over the wolf's long road to recovery, she'd slowly grown close to the man. Then one day he'd called her. He'd been trying to disable a trap, and it had snapped on his arm. He couldn't take it off. He couldn't drive. He was stuck. All he could do was take out his phone and call her. She'd wondered why he hadn't called his brother Cross, but later, much later, she'd found out Cross's bear would have killed him if he'd found him unable to defend himself. She found Lance's truck parked next to it and headed off for the woods. He'd given her specific directions. When she arrived on the scene, she found a bear in a trap, not Lance. She'd stayed a good distance from the trapped grizzly. She may love animals, but she was no fool. She knew exactly what a grizzly could do to her. But where the hell was Lance? He said he was caught in a trap. Were there two traps? Then the grizzly saw her. He locked his gaze on her. His eyes flashed, an indigo color in their depths, almost like Lance's eye color. She'd backed up. She had to find Lance. The rangers could deal with the bear. She'd call them. Mac reached for her phone. Her case always on her hip was empty. What the hell? She dropped her phone somewhere. Now she couldn't call Lance. She couldn't call the rangers. All she could do was, maybe she could run to her jeep, see if the phone was there. And she could call Lance. She turned toward the clearing she'd parked in and started that way, ignoring the bear and the crunching and creaking sounds it made behind her. Mackenzie. Lance's voice sounded hoarse with pain. She whirled around. The bear was gone. In the same place the bear had been lay Lance on the forest floor, trap around his forearm, incapacitating him, blood draining from the wound. He'd been pale, his twinkling navy blue eyes dull. I'm not hallucinating. I can't be. So what the hell is going on here? Lance? She ran toward him, trying to keep her medical bag from jostling too much. I could have sworn I just saw. Never mind. She'd sound crazy. With his directions and his brawn, she managed to free him from the trap then wrapped gauze around his arm. The forest floor was full of blood. His clothing was covered in crimson. Can you walk to your truck? I'll take you to the hospital. No hospital, he groaned. Take me to docks. You'll need more than that. No. Listen, I can't argue with you. You've lost enough blood already. You? A growl interrupted Lance. She whirled around. Four wolves snarling approached. Not good. Not good at all. The blood had brought them in, and now they stood between them and the vehicles, 
not that Lance could have run to the vehicle with her anyway. Hiaya, she yelled at the pack. They hadn't been impressed. The wolves stood their ground. I can't have you getting hurt, Lance said. And don't run from them. That would play right into what they want. You have to let me take care of this, and promise me you won't be afraid. She frowned. He was delirious from blood loss. Get behind me, turn around, don't watch. Promise me you won't look. Okay. She'd stepped back, turned around. She hadn't meant to lie. But then came the growls, followed by a bellow that was much too close for comfort, and created by a creature that had to be very much larger than the wolves. She'd spun around. Where Lance had been, a grizzly stood. The same grizzly, if she had to make a guess. The wolves were clearly not happy about the grizzly's appearance, but they gave in to the larger predator, turning tail and running into the trees. She spun back, facing away, and closed her eyes. If the bear was going to turn around and kill her, she wasn't going to be watching him when he did. The forest went silent. The bear's breath, heavy and hot, had laid on her body, leaving a sensation of warm humidity against her flesh. A shiver coursed down her spine. She remained frozen. Still she kept her eyes closed. The bear's heated snorts didn't go away. For what felt like eternity, but probably hadn't been much more than seconds, she squeezed her eyes tightly. Then the creaking and crunching sounds she'd heard earlier. Then silence. Complete and total silence. So much so she'd opened her eyes. He leaning against a tree, his face a diagram of pain. His features drawn, eyes watching her, the man who'd saved the wolf. She'd said not a word, studying him. She knew what this meant. Oh yeah. She'd heard of shifters. But who would have believed it? He was silent, waiting for her reaction. When she hadn't given him one, he spoke. I wanted to tell you in my own good time. The course of their relationship had been natural. The woman who didn't trust and quit believing in humanity had met a man who was so much more than human. The woman who could only trust animals had found a man who shared his soul with a beast. Mac had no defenses against this. She finally met the one person she could trust. Until that day, the day he'd left. Chapter 7 Mac looked at Lance across the small span of Astra and Kane's cabin. The distance between them could be measured in feet, yet their divide was more like the Grand Canyon. She should hate him. She wanted to hate him. But how can you hate something that is a part of you? Something that was the very best part of you for a measure of time, that seemed to span eternity, but was only a few years? I'm not sure I can do this. No, she couldn't. She couldn't be this close to him while they weren't together. She flinched, the couple bond mark burning intensely. She fought to hide her reaction. A scorching heat began in the spot between her shoulder and neck, where he'd bitten her in the throes of passion, then let the essence of his bear slip into her body. Heat traveled through her veins, her body tingled. This was more than sexual. Her soul was reacting to his, to his bear's. Mac turned so she couldn't see him. Ariadne was directly behind her, nibbling on one of the puffs, alone, while Cross was next to May and Doc. I can't be here, she whispered the words to Ariadne. What is it? Ariadne put the pastry on a plate, her expression worried. Do you need to go outside? Mac struggled to breathe, but her lungs felt as if they'd been paralyzed. This shouldn't be happening. The damned witch doctor said the couple bond would be broken. Yes. No, I have to go. Was the witch doctor's remedy supposed to make her feel like this? She'd thought she was to feel nothing when she was around Lance. Not like she had World War III being waged within her. She looked at the front door. Blocked by May, Doc Cross and worst of all Lance. She looked at the kitchen door. I'm going out the back door. I'll get some fresh air. If I feel better, I'll be back. If not, I'll text you tomorrow. She knew she wasn't coming back. She knew she wouldn't be feeling better. It was getting worse with every passing moment. Ariadne put a hand on her shoulder. Be careful. They were talking about some kind of storm. 
said it was a freakish thing, unexpected and coming quickly. Maybe Cross and I should take you home. Just to be sure. Don't be silly. I'll be fine. And she was fine. For most of the way. Except she had only been to Astra and Kane's twice before. And that had been during the daytime. Funny how different things looked as the sunlight waned. There were a few turns, but it looked familiar to Mac. She was sure she was headed in the right direction. Snow began to fall, wind blew the white thickness making visibility a challenge. She slowed, made sure she stayed in the middle of the road and that her headlights were on. At least the burning on the side of her neck had gone away. First thing Monday morning, she was going to take a day trip to Seattle. It wasn't a matter of getting a refund anymore, it was a matter of finding out how this went so horribly wrong. At this rate, I'd have been better off if I hadn't messed with the couple bond. She pushed the thought away. She needed to concentrate on driving and the conditions. And the road. Suddenly, this part of the drive didn't seem familiar. And she was doing fine. Until a flash of brown ran in front of her jeep. Mac hit the brakes swerved. She shoved her foot onto the clutch. Everything happened so fast, she couldn't have said what happened first. The next thing she knew, the jeep was on its side off the road. She was stuck and had hit her head. She could feel the trickle of blood sliding from the laceration she knew was there. And as if that wasn't enough, the damn snow was falling fast. She pushed on the seatbelt's release. Nothing. Come on, come on. She prayed for the reassuring click that would signal the seatbelt's surrender. Still nothing. She'd call for help. Someone would find her. She looked at the seat next to her, which now was above her, since the wreck had laid the jeep on its side. Her purse wasn't there. She glanced around. No luck. Then she put it together. If she couldn't see it, that meant it was probably behind her. Fuck. Damn. Fuck. And the snow kept falling. She struggled against the seatbelt, but in the infinite, insert a sarcastic tone here for fuck's sake, in the infinite wisdom of the Jeep's designers there was no give. None whatsoever. She was stuck until she could get the damn thing to click free. The snow still fell. The forest became darker. Her car's motor stopped running. The blood wouldn't stop trickling. The icing on the cake, her eyes grew heavy. Chapter 8 Lance looked away from Cross, ignoring his bear's roars. He glanced back at Mac. She wasn't there. Cross's mate, Ariadne, was standing alone, a confused and concerned expression on her face. But no Mackenzie. And he couldn't feel her. He walked toward the kitchen, where she'd been standing the last time he saw her. She'd been talking to Ariadne. Do you know where Mackenzie went? She went outside for some fresh air. I don't think she felt great. That added to Lance's guilt meter, throwing it off the charts. Of course it was his fault. He was the one who made her unhappy now. Unlike four years ago, when he used to make her happy. He blew out a breath, then slipped out the kitchen door. Yup. Just as he'd thought, feared. Her jeep was gone. Mac was gone. You just can't help yourself. It was Cross's voice, but it wasn't. The growly timbre came through. Lance whirled. He'd heard that tone. He didn't know what it was, and why his and Cross's bears had a beef, but the enmity seemed bound and determined to be to the death. I don't have time for this right now. No, you only have time to fuck up someone else's life, don't you? Cross transformed into his grizzly with a speed that caught Lance off guard. Cross's bear reared back on his hind legs. He swung, his claw seeking purchase in Lance's flesh. Lance jumped back. He couldn't keep his bear from responding. He didn't have the mental energy to avoid Cross's bear claws while holding his own bear back. It only took that bit of destruction for Lance's bear to take over. He morphed into his bear with the speed of one who practiced shifting regularly, as his enforcer position required. Lance's bear roared with rage, stormed Cross's bear, biting and shoving, rearing up, damaging his brother's bear's flesh. 
Lance wasn't unscathed. Cross's bear found the purchase of flesh he'd been seeking. He slammed his claws deeply into Lance's fur, penetrating muscle. Lance reared and bucked, shoving it Cross trying to take him down. They both lost their balance, falling to the ground with enough force to knock the breath out of them and cause the air to vibrate. A scream brought their battle to a pause. Thunder boomed. Lightning crashed behind the cabin. Lance looked up. May was on the porch, her hands over her mouth. She was the one who'd screamed. She strode toward them. Her normally dark brown eyes were a midnight turbulent blue. You will stop now. Behind her, as if accentuating her words, thunder rolled. Lance backed away. He shifted to his human form, out of respect for May. He swiped at his face, his hand coming away bloody. Cross's bear growled, then he morphed into his human body. Never again. I will find someone who has an answer. This is not allowed to happen. I didn't agree to take the both of you into my home so you could kill one another. We will find an answer to this. Snow swirled around her dark hair. Tiny flakes catching to her clothing then melting. Not now we won't. Lance had to find Mac. He fished his keys out of his pocket, ignoring the pain from the scuffle with his brother. He'd find her. He got in his truck and drove off without glancing back at May, Cross, or the assembly of humans and shifters that had gathered on the porch, looking between his departing truck and Cross. In Lance's mind, one scene kept playing over and over. Four years, three weeks ago. Lance and Mackenzie had the most amazing afternoon. Greatest sex ever. Then again, every time was the greatest sex ever. Then he left to give his bear a run. He shifted in the forest and gave the bear free will. Lance had a decision to make. His goal was simple. He wanted retribution to be doled out on those who had killed his parents. He was confident the information was somewhere with the Shifter Council in New York. And Cross had just gone to work for them as an enforcer. Lance would too. He'd get the information he needed. He'd already talked to their recruiter. The guy said Lance was made for the position of enforcer. That his personality was a perfect match. Except there was one problem. A major one. Enforcers had a high mortality rate. Quite a few didn't survive the first four-year tour. They suggested shifters who enlisted not be involved. That worrying about someone back home would make them less effective. That having someone back home who might lose them was not recommended. So Lance made a hard decision. He'd rather break Mackenzie's heart now than to have her heart broken when he was killed. He walked and regretted it every step of the way. His whole mission had turned to shit. There was no information about who killed his parents. There was no retribution. No. Just one loser who walked away from the best thing he ever had. He pulled into the driveway, looked at her cottage. No lights. No sign of life. No tire marks. Nothing. Mac hadn't been here yet. Maybe she wasn't coming. Maybe she had someone else she would go to. Maybe she had a life that didn't involve Lance, and maybe, just maybe, it was his imagination that she still had feelings for him, other than feelings of hate. Here he was, looking for the woman whose heart he'd split in two, himself a broken man, four years wasted, thinking of what he shouldn't have done. And here, now, she'd left the gathering and he couldn't find her. He made a U-turn in the clinic's parking lot and headed out. Where? He started toward the mountains. He'd give it another shot, then he'd head up to Devil's Horn. He had no business being out, not when a storm was clearly setting in. He called May, hoped she'd not discuss his fight with Cross. Lance, where are you? Not a question he wanted to answer right now. You guys should consider getting out while you can. It's pretty bad in the valley already. Blankets of snow. Man, was he glad for four-wheel drive. We left early, right after you did. Where are you? In a special hell of my own creation. Driving. He didn't like lying to May. He wouldn't.
Be safe. Will do. You too. He'd almost pressed the button to end the call when he heard May's voice again. Lance? He put the phone to his ear. Yeah. It may be nothing, but Max not answering her phone. Fuck. That's not nothing. Chapter 9 Lance lost track of how long he'd been driving. Where the hell was she? He traced all but one road that led from Astra and Kane's. He was on the last road. It was dark as hell outside, the fucking snow wouldn't stop falling, and the goddamned wind sounded like a banshee. Yeah, safe to say he was in a bad mood. Bad would have been an understatement at this point. How could a woman vanish from the side of a mountain like this? Then he saw it. Her jeep. Flipped. Off the road. His heart refused to beat. His lungs were paralyzed. He slammed on the brakes and shifted into park, jumping out, uncaring about the temperature or the fact he didn't have on a coat. The jeep was laying on its side. He ran to it, pulled the door open. She was lying there, a laceration on her head. Her face was pale, lips light blue, and her body was shaking. Mackenzie, I'm going to cut you loose. So cold. I know, baby. Shit. He couldn't say that. Hang on. Lance pulled out his pocket knife, flicked it open, and slashed through the tough fabric. Carefully and awkwardly, he lifted her out of the vehicle. He barely managed to get his truck door open while holding Mac in a fireman's carry. He situated her on the bench seat, laying her across, then strode to his side and got in. He cranked the heat up, then pushed her short hair from her forehead. When did she decide to cut her hair? Probably because he'd once asked her to keep her hair long. Maybe she cut it out of spite or anger. It didn't matter. He loved it. Who am I kidding? I love her. Any way she was, he'd always love her. And with that, he shifted into reverse. He couldn't take her to her cottage. He'd never make it there. Closest place was his cabin. She's going to kill me. At least she'd be alive. Yeah, but he could call May to help. Or. No. He needed to talk to her. He owed her an explanation. No, he owed her more than that. He owed her an apology. If there was one thing he'd learned over the last four years, he had fucked up royally. So he owed her an explanation and an apology. Not that it would change the way she felt about him, but maybe it would change his self-loathing. She was still shaking, though the truck's cabin was warm. Warm enough to make this grisly shifter sweat. Lance pulled up as close as he could to his front door, killed the engine, then carried her through the wind and swirling snow. What the fuck kind of freak snowstorm was this? The forecasters had foretold some weather, but he hadn't figured it'd be like this. Once inside his cabin, he slid her into his bed. The only bed in the place, of course. He grimaced. He'd take the couch while the storm blew over. And now to get the heat on. He lit the pilot on the heater. It kicked on. After grabbing the first aid kit from the pantry, washcloths, and a bowl of water, he headed toward his bedroom. Mac had rolled over and was lying on her side. Lance nudged her gently, turning her to face him. He dampened the washcloth, placed it on the laceration on her face. As he tucked her hair behind her ear, he leaned over her. Was that blood? He dampened another washcloth and began to rub away the blood on the side of her neck near where it met her shoulder. On the exact spot where he'd couple bond marked her all those years ago. That isn't blood. He pushed the high neckline of her top away. A tattoo covered a two-inch span right over the spot where he'd marked her. What the hell? It was a tattoo of a claw mark, complete with tiny drops of blood. She put a tattoo over our couple bond mark. Yeah, like it meant so much to you that it kept you from walking away. Although the thoughts were his own, they echoed the sentiments of his bear. His bear had never forgiven him for leaving Mackenzie behind. Lance had been sure his bear was going to get him killed while on assignments. That was how angry his beast was. 
The grizzly just didn't get it that Lance had to go. He had to find out who killed his parents. He'd been certain the answers were in the records in New York. With the Shifter Council. He heaved a sigh. Some questions may never be answered. Some revenges may never be achieved. And he'd thrown everything he had with Mackenzie away for those unattainable things. His bear roared. I tell you to stifle it, but you saved my life already once today with Cross's bear. His bear snarled, not arguing the point. What have you done, Mackenzie? Why? Why this tattoo? Chapter 10 Lance's voice filtered through the fogginess surrounding Mac. A miserable cold had settled into her bones. Her head ached from being hit. She could feel herself healing though, healing because of the couple bond with Lance that had made her a shifter's mate. Shifter's mates couldn't do the hibernation heal, but they didn't take as long to recuperate as humans. The cold had sapped her energy, left her in a lethargic state of inaction. She'd passed out, unable to get out of the seatbelt, unable to reach her phone, completely and totally helpless. Then, what had seemed an eternity later, the door had opened. Lance's voice had seeped through the cold's fierce grasp on her body and mind. Her body had been moved. Warm air surrounded it but still she couldn't budge, captive to the cold that had set in. Another eternity later, once again, Lance's voice cut through the cold unconsciousness. Mac's mind flew to a cognizant state of being. Her body didn't respond, as if cold still held it, unwilling to give up the prisoner. Lance was there, as if in her dreams. He was asking about the tattoo. Wait, how, when did he find out about the tattoo? Her body so in tune to his, still, picked up the vibrations of his confusion and frustration. She sensed his questions, felt his sorrow, commiserated with his confusion. Max sank back into Cold's clutches. It was easier to be in the shackles of unfeeling Cold than to feel the array of emotions bombarding Lance. He wouldn't understand. He couldn't understand what had driven that decision all those years ago. That one sunny day, a couple of years ago. It had started out as just another day at the clinic, on the computer, analyzing data on migration patterns. The phone rang. A ranger near Kerr D'Aline called about a grizzly. Grizzly. Max sighed. She still thought of Lance. And though half of her hated him, the other half missed him greatly. He'd been gone almost two years. Yes, she knew to the minute how long he'd been gone, but she was trying to break herself of counting those days, minutes, seconds. Damn. Him. Damn the heartbreaking soulless bastard. I'll bring my medical supplies, Mac told Raven, her ranger friend. You won't need them. Just thought you'd want to come see. See what? Raven laughed. Just get here. Mac drove toward the national park, taking the roads above the speed limit. What could Raven want her to see? Mac met Raven a little over two years ago, not long after Lance had vanished. They'd both been called in to Olympic National Park. As she recalled it, that had been for a grizzly-related matter as well. Mac loved her job, loved that part of the perks included being invited to sites and situations involving wildlife. She thanked her lucky stars she'd interned under the same professor as Raven's older sister, Skye. When Professor Mawada had asked her if she'd like to be considered for the Bear Canyon Wildlife Reserve, that they had an opening, she jumped for the chance. Getting paid to do what she loved? Hell yes. She'd come to the valley. She'd met Lance. She'd lost Lance. Now she was headed to Kerr D. Aline. My life could be summed up in bullet points. She pulled into the wooded area near the park. Raven's vehicle, a Cherokee 4x4, was one of several vehicles. Raven stepped out of the trees. She put a finger to her lips. Mac nodded, raised her shoulders in question. Grizzly babies, Raven whispered. No mama? Nope. Raven's tone was filled with sadness. What? No way. She would never believe that. No mama bear would abandon her babies. Unless she was dead. They're special. Mac cocked her head. Special, she whispered. 
we're taking them to new homes. Homes. Odd word choice. What about the mother? Dead. Father brought them this far. Then died. Wait. What? That's not how grizzlies work. We knew you'd be the perfect one. Perfect what? To monitor them, to keep up with them. After they are placed with their families. I'm so confused. She silently followed Raven into the woods. Her confusion didn't last long. Those baby grizzlies. They were shifter babies. A man and woman stood in front of the grizzly cubs, their backs to Mac. She stared as two little girls, toddlers really, dressed in dirty once pink and green outfits, twins clearly, who sat next to each other on a log staring at the grown-ups surrounding them. The little girls roared then shifted into young cubs. The cubs cuddled each other, their eyes wide. Oh my, Mac whispered. She didn't know what else to say. Yeah she did. She turned to Raven. Why me? Because. The man and woman faced Mac. She knew one of them. May? What was May doing here? You were chosen because you are mated to a shifter, the man said. He was older, wide-set shoulders, and sported a scar that split his eyebrow and extended clear down to his jaw. Do, I don't know you. That was all Mac could think to say, but she kept her eyes glued on May. We need you to take records of their existence. Of their lives. Their whereabouts, the man told her as if she hadn't just said she had no clue who he was. Raven? May? Care to explain? May stepped closer to Mac. You were chosen. You are a grizzly shifter's mate. I'm not his mate. I thought that was public knowledge. You'll always be his mate, the man said. I don't think so. Mac wasn't going to admit it, but his proclamation made a vein of fury run through her body. I've looked into shifter lore. I know there's a way to nullify the couple bond. I'm going to find someone to do it. The man glanced at May. May shook her head. I wish you wouldn't. Lance is your true mate. He's been foolish, but that will pass. He will be back. He can't help himself. Oh, and I'll be sweet Becky Hamaki, just waiting for that big strong man to come back to me. After four years. That's the deal? Really? Mac couldn't keep the bitterness from her voice. She couldn't keep it from her heart either. No. May reached for Mac. Don't say that. Mac backed up. She wanted no comforting. She wanted no excuses. There were no amends. A light bulb went off in her mind. My position with the Bear Canyon Wildlife Reserve? That has something to do with. She didn't want to believe it. Please don't let them say it's because of Lance. I didn't even know him back then. I didn't. It's because of you, the man said. You were the right one for the job. So you were given it. Raven? Mac looked at the woman she'd known, the woman whose sister she'd gone to school with. Are you a part of this? There's really no this, the man interjected. There's you, the right woman for the job, who met her mate. You're still the right one for the job. Now Mac was even more pissed. What do you know about the Bear Canyon Wildlife Reserve? I fund it. The man's words were blunt. I sign your paycheck. Mac never saw the checks, they were direct deposited, but what reason would he have to lie? May nodded. Mackenzie, it's true. The little girls had shifted out of their bare forms and were sitting on the log, cooing to each other. Realization hit, the man was her boss, she should be respectful. Do they have names? Why are they here, instead of in a home? Trista and Tessa, the scarred man said. I was meeting their father. He's over there, he pointed. Not alive. Last name? No last name. Best to leave that out, so there's no cause for retribution or for anyone to find them. They need a fresh start on life. Away from their history and their parents' past. What do you need from me? We're going to place them with a shifter family. You'll keep up with them. Check on the girls every so often as part of your trips with the reserve's projects and business. 
You'll do this for several shifters and their families, as assignments come up. So my job with the Bear Canyon Wildlife Reserve, that was a front. All this time she thought she was doing good? No. The man glanced at the twins. That job is important and you still do it. It was no front. It was genuine and still is. You're merely going to augment it with this. It won't create extra work for you. We can make sure the salary stays commensurate with the work. As if this is all about money. I'm not worried about being compensated. I didn't think you were. You are. She waited for his name. You can call me Larson. Okay, Larson. Then she rethought her lackluster response. Thank you. I think. About what you said, Larson began. The shifter lore. You want that? You want to break the bond? Tears flooded to her eyes. Never. Yes, she said. I need to. For my peace of mind. To stop the constant ache in my heart and body. I can help you with that, Larson said. What? May's voice was loud, causing the twins to flinch and whimper. Sorry. May knelt on the forest floor. She held her arms out to the babies. They stuck their thumbs in their mouths at the same time, brown eyes wide staring at May, then jumped up and leapt into her hug. You can help me with what? Why did Mac feel she was bait-clicking? I can help you with your objective, to nullify your bond with the bear shifter. And you do that why? The man narrowed his eyes. Do you want my help, or do you want to question my motives? She recoiled from the intensity in his voice. Was he a shifter? I want your help. You'll go see my cousin in Seattle. She'll give you what you need. I'll give you the directions after we get the little ones packed. Meanwhile, you'll start a database. Larson, May started. He held his hand up, stopping her protest mid-sentence. What about all the shifter babies before these? Mac looked at the twins, then back at Larson. Is there an existing database? There is. Elsewhere. Now we start fresh again. He glanced at May. May nodded. You have a home for the girls. Make sure Mackenzie has the contact information. They'll still be kept together. Not separated, he asked. Mac found herself holding her breath, waiting for May to answer. It would suck for the little ones to lose each other, now that they were orphaned. May nodded. We've got the same home for both. Good. I like to see siblings kept together. Chapter 11 The Day of the Tattoo After setting up the records for the twins, Mac had tried to settle into her routine at work. She tried not to look at the paper with the number and the address and directions to Larson's cousin. She couldn't concentrate, though. Her eyes constantly drifted to the paper she'd folded in half and stuck to the side of the filing cabinet with a magnet. She needed to get moving on this. Every day was as hard if not harder than the day before. Missing Lance was eating her soul. It didn't take Mac long to make arrangements to visit Larson's cousin in Seattle. She'd wrapped up her plans and headed out the door before dawn. Misha, her sheepdog, would spend the weekend with the clinic's help. A few hours later, the GPS said she was ten minutes away. She followed the directions, a little bit nervous and a little bit excited about the visit. And a whole lot of sad filled her, leaving Mac with a void. This is it. After this, my bond with him will be broken. Did she really want that? He broke our bond when he left. But why? She fought the reflex to call Lance. Her fingers itched with a desire to dial him, see if he had the same number, tell him what she was planning, find out if he had any feelings on the matter. Of course he has no feelings. If he did, he'd have reached out. He'd have told me why he's doing this. Yeah, he didn't give a shit. It was time for her to move on. She took a left. And another. And another. Jesus, where the hell am I going? She wasn't going into Seattle. She was going farther from civilization. The GPS quit showing a route, instead, proclaiming it was searching for satellite reception. 
just fucking great. She fumbled for the paper she'd put in her purse. It had a few directions from Larson. Past the owl mailbox. She'd seen that. Turn left when the road dead ends. Okay, that hadn't happened yet. She was still good. The road ended less than 30 yards farther. She should have slowed. Max slammed on the brakes, sending the contents of her purse pitching into the floorboard on the passenger side. Lovely. Battery acid sarcasm reflected in her voice. She ignored the spilled contents and clutched the note. Fourth house on left. House. What the fuck? That was not a house. That was a hut. A shack. Made of tin and wood and probably spit. The grass had grown tall, waist-high, except for a narrow path's worth of real estate leading to the front door. Here goes nothing. She stepped into the path, feeling more like she'd put foot into another world, another time even. At the end of the path, past the tall weeds, she could see her ultimate goal. The hut. Step by step, mindful of snakes, Mac made her way, finally stopping at a front door that looked like it couldn't withstand a knock for fear the wood might collapse. Mac wrapped her knuckles on the door jamb instead, feeling certain it at least could withstand a bit of pressure. The door opened to a woman unlike any she'd ever seen. This is his cousin. Long white blonde hair. Eyes so light a blue, they were almost indistinguishable from her whites. Her skin was a dusky tan color, offsetting the eeriness of her irises. She was attired in a long white gown, flowing to her ankles. Her feet were in sandals composed of strings or weed cuttings. She returned Mac's stare, not saying a word, not moving, no expression on her face. Mac regained her composure, tried to hide her shock at seeing the woman. Larson sent me. You're Mackenzie Clarity. Her voice was accentless, her tone neutral. She wasn't asking a question. She was telling Mac she knew who she was. Creepy. Mac nodded. Larson said you could help me. Yes. He mentioned the bear shifter's woman. Ah. Thanks for the reminder. That's right. Your aura is strong. The bond is strong. Why do you need it dissolved? Is that really any of your business? But she couldn't say that so she opted for, he had other plans. The cousin, what the hell is her name, narrowed her eyes. Odd. You are. Sierra. So, can you help me? I can give you what you need. That's what Larson said. Sierra motioned her inside. The interior was much better than the outside. Clean state-of-the-art accessories, coffee machine, fridge, stove. For a one-room shack, someone had spent quite a bit to make the inside as comfortable as possible. So why the dilapidated, deteriorated outside? Why make it look like something you'd never want to go in? To discourage thieves, trespassers? You live here? No. That's it? That's all she's going to say? Sierra wore a forbidding expression, clearly in place to dissuade more questions and prevent prying. Sierra handed her a robe. Put this on. A few questions buzzed in Mac's mind. Starting with why. Yet for some damned reason, she couldn't get any of the questions to come out of her mouth. Sierra pointed toward a door. You can change in there. The restroom was the same as the rest of the interior. Modern. Clean. Untouched. Unlived in. With quite a bit of trepidation, Mac shrugged out of her top, left her bra on, and slipped the robe, reminded her of the one she'd worn the last time she'd visited a day spa, over it. She came out, questions on the tip of her tongue. Sierra had taken out a kit. It looked like a tackle box, the biggest she'd ever seen. And the woman had a table that reminded her of the ones she'd lain on when she'd been to the day spa. What are we going to do? Sierra was plugging in an instrument. Mac eyeballed it. She'd seen enough TV to know what the hell that was. A tattoo gun. What the hell is she doing with that? Mac gave the instrument the stink eye. I'm not sure you're... I'm not. What are? She couldn't manage to put a phrase together, much less a whole sentence. This is part of the procedure. 
The formula is in the ink. The tattoo will keep it sealed in. None of this made sense to Mac. Then again, a couple of years ago being mated, couple bonded even, to a grizzly bear shifter wouldn't have made sense. Nor would it have been believable. And it will work? You're sure? She wasn't exactly willing to go through the pain of a tattoo, for nothing. Anyway, what guarantee was there it would work? Sierra was facing away, fiddling with the instrument. She turned toward Mac. Would you rather not go through with this? And be forever stuck in this state of love for Lance? Not a chance. Just do it. She sat in the chair, leaned back and tried to take her mind somewhere else. Somewhere that didn't feel the sting of the needle. Somewhere that didn't feel the sting of tears, not for the physical pain, but for the emotional pain of being torn asunder from what she had shared with Lance. A million times Mac thought of Lance during her time in that chair, staring at the sterile white ceiling above. A million times she wanted to stop the procedure, get in her jeep and find Lance, if only to get answers. Present day. The day had been hell for her. A hell that fueled her emotions to this very day. Chapter 12 Except now Mac was next to Lance. Though her body was fighting to recover from the exposure to the cold. Though her head throbbed from being hurt. Though her mind was pushing him away. That damn tattoo burned like it was on fire. Then it felt like it was moving, undulating in waves against her skin. What the heck? and her body ached with the need for him. Not just sexually. Not just emotionally. But an ache that transcended all the different planes of need. It encompassed her very core in a grip tighter than she could bear. What have you done, Mackenzie? Why? Why this tattoo? His words reverberated, bouncing in her mind, echoing in the chambers of her emotions. What had she done? No different than he'd done. He tried to cut her out of his life by leaving. She tried to cut him out of hers in a different way. She opened her eyes. Lance loomed in front of her. A large vision that still took her breath away, still made her heart beat. His head was buried in his hands, his profile one of desolation. The same fucking desolation she'd felt in her heart every day since he'd left. Mac put her hand on his arm. The surge of energy that traveled through her body, and culminated in her nerve endings, gave her an awareness as if she just opened her eyes to a new dimension. Lance turned his head slowly, as though dreading what he'd see. What is that about? His voice was a tortured croak. Mac exhaled. Don't worry. It didn't work. Work? His brow furrowed. How was it supposed to work? What does it matter? She closed her eyes, shutting him out. I won't make it that easy for you. His words broke through her barrier and hit the bull's eye of her fury. Mac's eyes flew open. Easy? What did you make easy for me at all? Leaving me to pick up the pieces of my broken heart. She cursed herself for telling him he'd left her brokenhearted. Struggling to sit up, she pushed herself only to find she was weak. Lance tried to help her, grasping her shoulders. She shoved his hands away. I don't need your help. I don't need anything from you now. Except? She didn't want to admit to herself she did need something. She so did. She needed his love. Despite the failed tattoo, despite Sierra's failed solution. First thing I'm doing when I get home is contact Sierra or Larson. Someone better have an explanation why this was such an epic failure. You may not need anything, but I owe you something. She glanced at him from the corner of her eye. What did he think he owed her? And that would be? An explanation. Why I did what I did. Is that your way of trying to change the way things are? Lance glanced down at his hands. She noticed they were clenched into fists, his knuckles white, the forearms she'd loved had tendons popping out, muscles hard with tension. He looked up from his fists, his eyes locking with hers. The tormented deep blue color had shards of amber swimming within. No. We. I. My bear and I. We both know we're done. We know you don't want us, and what we did was unforgivable. 
Go on. Why? Why did you shatter everything we had? His gritted his teeth, the sound painful, a harbinger of the emotions within him. I've had questions. Lance rose to his feet and paced in front of her, quads flexing and legs that belonged on a professional athlete. He passed in front of the light, eclipsing it, then releasing it to shine as he kept pacing. I thought I would get the answers when I joined the compliance unit. Did you? She was dying to ask but didn't because she suspected he still had more to say. No. I didn't but. He stopped, turned to face her. The recruiter said the enforcer unit had a high mortality rate. Mac cocked her head. She was sure from the way he paused that something important was coming next. I didn't want to die and leave you, our love, behind. But you didn't die. Her voice carried all the poison of four painful years. I'm guessing you wish I had. Creases of frustration and worry lined his face. Not in a million years. I'd have given my life for yours. She couldn't say that. She couldn't say anything. The only thing she could do was find out what had gone wrong with Sierra's procedure and have it rectified. I'd like to go home. Chapter 13 Lance bit back a response. A damned angry response at that. That's all she has to say. You can't go home now. There's a blizzard underway. I could barely see well enough to get you here, and now it's a thousand times worse. Mac glared at him. I'm not lying. Call me. Call Ariadne. Call anyone you want to verify. Her look as much as told him to fuck off. She glanced around. This is the cabin you bought. The one I never got to see. Damn. He fought to contain his temper. You don't have to make it sound like that. When I bought it, it wasn't much more than a shack I ignored for years. Judge set it up for me. Everything you see here, it's courtesy of Judge. Well, I paid for it, sure. But he arranged for the renovations and the setup. So you're back? For good? She threw her arms up. Lance moved to get out of her way, but not too far, because he wasn't sure if she was strong enough to stand. For good. Was it for good? Maybe. It would depend on her answer. If she wanted nothing to do with him, then he'd re-up with the compliance unit. What else could he do? Lance loved his mountain, loved his cabin, and he loved the valley. But none of those mattered if Mac wasn't a part of his life. Never mind. She spat her sentiment as she put her weight on her legs. Clearly, he'd taken too long to reply. He studied her silhouette. The curves he'd loved so much four years ago still had the same effect on him. He couldn't imagine anyone else with her. Mackenzie. What? She snapped her head to face him. What? I don't want you saying something you don't mean. I don't want anything from you. I'm not going to say something I don't mean. You know me better. Then what? I'd stay in a heartbeat. I'd stay if you didn't hate me. I can't be with you. I'm not doing heartache again. Again. First her parents disappoint her. Now I did. I don't blame her. She studied him, looking up and down. What happened to you? Shit. He'd forgotten to change clothes from the fight. Her gaze stayed focused on the blood and ripped shirt, the abrasions on his arms, a scratch on his lip that had already begun its shifter quick healing. It's nothing. No big deal. Tell me. Why? Yes, he wanted to be hostile. To ask her why. To know what she wanted from him, since she clearly didn't want him. The expression on her face brought him up short, shattering his hostility, melting his resolve. The innocent, hurt Mac he'd met years ago, vulnerable from her parents' neglect, stared back at him, in the depth of her eyes, where she probably didn't even realize it resided. Cross. His bear. Mine. The same thing from before. The same thing from all my life. Our bears, and their consummate hate, their determination to kill each other. I'd have thought that would have gone away. 
Have you seen each other much since you, he, since you both left? We haven't seen each other, at all. Lance leaned against the bed. His bear is hell-bent on killing mine. And you still don't know why. He didn't know five years ago when he discussed it with Mac, and he didn't know now. No clue. He attacked me when I was coming after you. It caused May a bit of distress. I thought your bears couldn't shift without you allowing them to. A long exhaled breath was ripped from his lungs. There seems to be a time when we can't control them. I know my brother wouldn't want to kill me. But his bear does. And so his bear wrestles control from him. My bear does the same. I can't stop his appearance when Cross's bear comes out. Definitely a good thing, since Cross's bear could kill me in my human body. Still no clue why that happens? Mackenzie's pulse changed. Her scent had changed too. Lance's bear realized it before Lance did and alerted him. Gone was the scent of her intense displeasure with being around him. Her scent was friendlier. Her pulse had normalized almost completely. Could they at least be cordial? Could Lance hope for a friendship? None. What's the tattoo about? What do you mean it didn't work? Mackenzie eyed him reminding him of a wild animal that wasn't sure if it could trust. She strode toward the desk he had set up in the corner and sat in the chair, leaned forward, elbows on knees, knuckles on chin. This was the farthest place she could sit in the whole room. So much for the cordial and friendlier thing. A man said he could help me. She paused. He gave me an address. What man? What are you? He pushed back the jealousy rearing its dark and ugly head. He'd walked away. He had no right to be jealous. No right to be pissed. Just a man. I met him through a friend. He clearly knows shifters. When did she get to know shifters, and when did she meet someone who clearly knew shifters? So what did this man who clearly knows shifters do? He wasn't sure he kept the jealousy or irritation from his tone. He has a cousin in Seattle. She put some sort of solution into the ink of a tattoo gun. Then she did this. Mackenzie waved at the tattoo. What was it supposed to do? He hadn't heard of this before. Did you pay them? Was she suckered? Mackenzie shook her head, as if disappointed. Five hundred. Five hundred dollars. For what? What was supposed to happen? She looked away, as if she didn't want to tell him. Break the couple bond. Set me free of you. The searing heat of pain drove through his chest. He couldn't breathe. His lungs were paralyzed, immobile. They left him struggling for air. She was trying to break their bond. Lance turned toward the window so she couldn't see his face. He studied the whiteness outside. A whiteness so void, so empty, it was like looking into the reflection of his heart, his life and anything involving Mackenzie not being a part of it. Chapter 14 Mac wished she'd been sitting anywhere but where she was. Why? Because she could see Lance's face in the window's reflection. The whiteness outside made the reflection of his face easy to read. His expressions told of his pain. He looked as if he'd had the worst news ever. How can this possibly hurt him when he walked away, never looked back, never reached out? She thought of the Lance she'd always known. The Lance who took a long time to open up, even though they'd been together. The Lance who didn't want to share his pain, didn't want to let anyone into his chamber of demons. That was what he'd called his weaknesses, his chamber of demons. She'd tried to tell him what he thought was a weakness was not. It was a normal reaction to life's curveballs. Then again, who was she to speak? She had her own chamber of demons. It just happened that her demons were different from his. She studied his face, his back, the way his spine was stiff, his shoulders squared. She knew him too well. She knew exactly what he was doing. He was trying to work his way through the notion she wanted him out of her heart and out of her life. A part of her ached for his pain. She knew it too well. Shit. She'd lived it for four years. I did this to you. His voice was low. I pushed you to that extreme. 
She wanted to tell him something to make him feel better. She couldn't. It would be a lie. Yes, he did push her to this. He was the solitary driving force behind her misery. I'm going back to Seattle. Back to that witch doctor woman. You should get a refund. A refund from a witch doctor? The notion was so damned wacky a smile made its way to her face, though she could see he was dead serious. Sometimes he said the funniest things. I owe you. Let me go with you. She did a double take. Why? Seems the least I could do. Were we too young when we couple bonded? Did I rush you? Every pore in her body screamed no, but she remained silent. The thing that kills me. He whirled around. How much I still want you, need you, crave you. And my bear's the same way. It kills me too. The tattoo burned, the sensation traveling throughout her body. I'll take you home in the morning, or as soon as the snow stops and the roads are clear. I'll make sure you stay safe. Lance strode toward the door, opened it and closed it behind himself. Mac then heard the front door open and close. Not two minutes after he'd walked out of the room, his grizzly lumbered through the snow, passing the same window he'd just been staring out of. His bare stride was slow, his posture dejected. Chapter 15 Lance stayed in his bare form, took cover in a cave and watched the cabin, tuned in to Mackenzie's heart rate. He knew she'd spent a sleepless night, tossing and turning. On occasion, he saw her silhouette in the window, looking for him. He knew when she fell asleep. Lance concentrated, pushing his bare back, the bone crunching, sinew realigning. Creaking sounds echoed in the little cave. He snuck into the cabin and made a call to May. Gave her a quick rundown of the situation, told her he wouldn't be there when she got there, then slipped out when he heard Max stirring. Lance resumed his watchful spot, staying in his human form, bundled in his coat, listening to Mackenzie's heartbeat, slow and steady in her slumber. He heard the footfalls coming from the back of the cave. He recognized the shuffle of an old friend. The cave had a tiny opening in the back, one that led to all the tunnels that had been in place under the mountain range for more than a couple hundred years. Story had it, one of the local shifters, a Native American, and grandfather to one of Bear Canyon Valley's residents, had put the system in place to keep shifters safe from attack. Lance was now fully shifted into his human body. Grizz. He called out to his old friend. The old shifter he hadn't seen in ages, more than four years, approached. Quite a storm. Grizz waved toward the cave's entrance, where the sun reflecting off the snow blinded their vision. Yeah. Lance studied the broad-shouldered shifter. The scar on the older man's face, splitting his eyebrow and reaching to his jawline, had become lighter in color. Lance hadn't seen Grizz since he'd made the decision more than four years ago to join the compliance unit. You show up at the damnedest times. Grizz had always been elusive, rarely crossing into Lance's life, except at times when it seemed Lance needed advice or guidance. That right? Grizz cleared his throat, raised his brows. Seems like. That would mean you're in a dilemma right now, wouldn't it? Grizz cocked his head. Are you? No. Sure. Because everyone wants to sleep in a cold cave, when they could be in their warm cabin. His laugh was low, but not overly derisive. It's what I do. Maybe a small dilemma. This involves the scent coming from the cabin. Lance narrowed his eyes. The older man always had too good a handle on matters. Yeah. That's the one you couple bonded with years ago. What gives? She got some kind of bullshit voodoo tattoo that's supposed to break our couple bond but it didn't work. So now, she's going back. And. Lance scrubbed his face with his hands, his day's growth making scratchy sounds. Hell, I don't know. Someone's approaching. Grizz had the look of a man who'd heard something no one else could hear. Which was exactly what Lance was feeling, because he couldn't hear anyone approaching. He turned his back on Grizz, stepped out of the cave, and into the snow to get a look down the mountainside. I hear an engine. I don't see anyone, he turned back. Grizz? The older shifter was gone. Grizz? 
Silence greeted him from the back of the cave. Bay and Doc stepped out of Doc's truck. Doc glanced around. Judge did a fine job with the cabin. Lance had to agree. His little brother had done it upright. May knocked on the cabin door. Lance? Mackenzie opened the door. May. Doc. What are you doing here? We came to get you. The weather's cleared. The roads aren't too bad. We called a tow truck for your jeep. But Lance. May wrapped a blanket around Mackenzie's shoulders. Lance had to go. Lance thanked his lucky stars for the best goddamn foster mother a guy could ask for. Chapter 16 Max spent a sleepless night, feeling Lance's presence in the near vicinity. Finally, when the sun came up, fatigue and the events from the day before pulled her into a deep slumber. She woke hours later judging from the sun's golden glow. Hunger pangs made her stomach growl. A knock at the door must have awakened her. May and Doc to the rescue. No Lance. Maybe he doesn't want to deal with me. Maybe he's walking away again. For another four years. She had to see the witch doctor. Period. Two days later, Mac was back at work in the clinic. She was lucky her cottage home was next to her job. So she didn't have to drive to work. Her tattoo still felt alive, then alternately as if it was on fire. Lance was clearly still in the valley, though he'd vanished when she'd been at his house. She needed to get this taken care of. She needed to get to Seattle. Like now. The problem was, she didn't have a car and the shop guy said it would be another week. A week? She'd practically screeched in his ear when he told her. It didn't seem as big a deal two days ago, but now, what with the tattoo acting up? Yeah, it was a big deal. Maybe I can borrow May's car for a quick trip. She was reaching for the phone to call May, when the bell above the clinic door pealed, signaling someone had opened the door. Mac glanced up. You. It was Larson, the witch doctor's cousin. Yes. His scar had faded from the last time she'd seen him, though it still marked his face with a white line, just not as white. I was going to see your cousin tomorrow. You said you'd help me. You didn't. She didn't. I said you'd get what you needed. What I needed? Which was? To not weaken your bond. So, I guess it's no surprise to you it didn't work. That the couple bond hasn't lessened. She controlled her fury. She had to. As much as she wanted to scream at him, she didn't want him to call his cousin and tell her not to help Mac with the redo. He nodded. I figured as much since the shifter you want to shove from your life is back in it. So you knew whatever she was doing to me wouldn't work. That it would be worse. That it's a sham. That there's no way to undo a couple bond. Jesus. It was getting harder and harder not to want to rip the man's throat out for tricking her. No, to the contrary. There's a very definite way to undo a couple bond. I couldn't have you pursuing that. So if my ruse made you think it worked. He shrugged. A placebo. You made me think it was working. Until I found out it wasn't. The hard way. Did he have any idea how difficult life was with this? Without Lance? I apologize for that, young lady. Not. Good. Enough. That man needs you in his life. You're the only salvation for his tormented soul. He's the salvation for yours. How do you know him? Chapter 17 Lance glanced at May's profile. Where are we going? He was pretty sure he knew the answer already. This was the way to Mackenzie's. A quick errand. Quick. Errand. So why was his radar going off then? What have you planned, Aunt May? Lance. She glanced at him, taking her eyes from the road for just a moment. Have I ever done anything that wasn't for your good? He couldn't argue that. He studied the flying landscape. He should have known when she invited him over for lunch, she had an agenda. She pulled into the Bear Canyon Wildlife Reserve Vet Clinic. 
I promise. This won't be too painful. Yeah. Every time I see Mackenzie is more painful than the previous time. A car sat in the driveway. Was it Ariadne's? Ariadne had told him she and Mackenzie were friends. May part. Lance got her door, then the door to the clinic. What the hell is going on here? Cross Ariadne Mac. Surprise, surprise. Grizz was there. Cross wore a scowl on his face. Lance was sure this was from his bear. He fought to keep his bear contained. Seems like there's a party going on here. Lance's bear bristled, clearly riled up by Cross's bear. Mackenzie looked from Lance to May, then to Grizz. We were just having a conversation when Cross and Ariadne walked up. She glanced at Lance and May. Who called this meeting together? Grizz nodded. Call me Grizz. And who are you, Grizz? Mackenzie seemed to get stuck on the name Grizz. Lance wondered what she thought his name was. She continued, How do you fit in? Why have you called this assembly? I should have done this long ago. His face grew sad. Long, long ago. Grizz faced Lance. I was your father's brother. Then he turned toward Cross. And your father's too. We had the same father, Lance countered. Grizz shook his head. No. Your father and his father were half-brothers. Your father, he pointed to Lance, killed Cross's father, then took the baby you, he pointed to Cross, to raise. Cross's father wasn't the best sort, but one brother killing the other, I'm thinking Cross's bear remembers that. And in the way of bears, it wants retribution. That's a lot to fucking absorb. My dad killed Cross's dad. We had different dads. Lance shook his head. What about my parents, who killed them? Cross's father's family. Vengeance. Cross squinted at Grizz then Lance. So we're not brothers? You're our cousins. Raised as brothers. This was too much to process. So his family, he pointed to Cross, killed my family. Yes, after your father killed his father. Lance crossed his arms over his chest. And you're another brother. Cross stepped forward. And you've been here all along in the mountains. I am. I was born Larson Del Cruz. I go by Grizz. I'm merely doing my duty. Keeping my nephew safe. From the world. From each other. From bad choices. May, Ariadne, and Mackenzie were silent, standing next to each other at the counter. What did they think about this? Lance turned his attention to Grizz. What about Judge? He's your brother. Same parents as you. He nodded at Lance. Lance was curious. Does he know about you? You all do. But I asked each of you to keep it a secret. And we all did. Cross looked at Lance. Lance nodded. That you did, Grizz agreed, then heaved a long harsh breath. Been quite a burden. Glad to let it out. Chapter 18 Mac understood they'd just learned a lot. That they'd had a bombshell dropped on them. She didn't want to be disrespectful, but she had her own problem. Everyone's arrival had interrupted her talk with Larson, Grizz, whatever the hell his name was. Hold on. They all turned to look at her. You, my, there's another unresolved matter. Lance's face was stoic but in the depths of his eyes his bear flashed golden flames. She couldn't bring herself to say what she had to say. She couldn't voice her failed attempt to break their couple bond. Not in front of all these people. Lance cleared his throat. Could I have a minute with Mackenzie, please? He opened the door and one by one they all filed out. May Grizz Ariadne. He turned toward Mac. A roar erupted in the room. On hind legs cross in his bare form swiped at Lance. Lance never stood a chance. He couldn't back up, he was against the filing table that held brochures and business cards. Cross's claws slashed through Lance's shirt. Max screamed. Blood bloomed scarlet on Lance's shirt. Cross's bear roared and reached for Mac. Another roar filled the room. A huge grizzly with a jagged scar on its muzzle stood between Mac and Cross's bear. Grizz. 
Grizz reared back, standing taller, he towered over Cross's bear. He bellowed, mouth wide, saliva dripping from lethally long canines. Her waiting room was going to be a bloodbath. Mac didn't know what she could do. Just outside the door, May and Ariadne watched, eyes wide. May's dark eyes were a brilliant indigo blue, sparkling, though her face was pale. May raised her arms. Behind May, lightning flashed across the sky and the rumble of thunder crashed through the bear's roars. Grizz's bear swiped at Cross's bear, connecting with Cross's flesh and fur. Blood spurted. Lance was leaning against the counter, his face ghostly white beneath his olive complexion. Mac's tattoo had gone ice cold, chilled fingers of dread pierced her skin. Her veins coursed with glacier water. She could feel Lance's heartbeat begin a slow fade. He needed to go into a healing, hibernation. Oh yeah, Mac knew all about healing to hibernate. Lance had told her all about hibernation healing, the day after they'd faced the wolves. God no, she whispered, not audible above the thunder and the bear's growls. Mac ran to Lance. Go. This is, he gasped for a breath, and more blood flowed onto his already saturated shirt. Go Mackenzie. I don't want you hurt. He didn't want her hurt. He was dying. She could feel his essence and strength flowing out of him. She could feel it from the couple bond between them, that was stronger than ever. Grizz is going to kill Cross. She didn't know this for sure, but the look in Grizz's bare eyes petrified her. No. I can't let him kill my brother. Lance stumbled forward between the two bears. He faced Grizz his back to Cross. Time stood still. It was as if they were in a tunnel that was getting smaller, and the spotlight was on the two bears and the mortally wounded man who stood between them. The bears were frozen. Grizz's claw was raised high, ready to strike Cross's bear. Cross was lunging forward. Then there was Lance. In the middle. In his human body. Bleeding. Dying. No. Lance stumbled forward. You will not hurt my brother. He almost pitched face forward into Grizz's fur-covered body. Mac couldn't sit back and watch the catastrophic train wreck happening between the bears and her mate. Stop this, he yelled. She ran between them, wrapped her arms around Lance's waist to keep him from collapsing. She heard the creaking sounds, the bones crunching. She knew that sound all too well. Cross and Grizz had shifted into their human forms. They reached for Lance, helping Mac hold him up. He needs to shift. Cross's tone caught Mac off guard. She glanced at his face. Remorse was the only emotion there. Is this over? Grizz's tone was gruff. Can I count on this being done? For good? Cross nodded. And your bear? Where does he stand on this? There was enough of a growl in Grizz's voice to let Mac know his bear was close to the surface. Cross looked at Lance. Then he glanced at Ariadne. Something changed in his face. Family. Cross kept his eyes on Ariadne. Family is the most important thing. My bear is coming to a realization. What Lance and I do, who we are, has nothing to do with the mistakes our fathers made. We are brothers. Mac felt Lance's heartbeat falter, he was losing the battle. His blood loss was too much for his body. He needs to heal. Now. Let's get him to the back. The idea of losing Lance ripped her to shreds, far more than his vanishing from her life had. She couldn't bear the notion of Lance being dead. No. That she couldn't do. Ever. If he wanted to live life without her, well that wasn't in her control. But having him dead was simply not an option. Grizz and Cross carried Lance to the large examination room in the back, the one reserved for large animals with no table, but with hay in the corner, where horses and cattle and even a deer had been brought. They gingerly placed him on the hay. Mac put a folded blanket under his head. Shift. You need to heal. Shift, she begged of him. Nothing. No movement. No shifting. Mackenzie. She looked up at Grizz. What? He has no reason to heal. He has no reason to live. It dawned on her. Lance had no idea her heart had changed. 
Nah, my heart never changed. Her heart had always been his. Seeing him almost die. Knowing she almost lost him. She leaned close to his cheek, her hand on his head tucked in his hair. Come back to me, Lance. I want you. I need you. Then she said the words she'd never spoken. Not once. The words she couldn't have spoken, and couldn't have been dragged out of her by wild horses. I love you. She felt his morphing. She felt his heartbeat skip then give a strong beat. In her mind, where she was the closest to Lance, she felt his sinew and tendons stretching. She sensed his bones lengthening. Mac backed up but kept her hand on his head. She closed her eyes and rested her head against his, let her breathing synchronize with his. Her fingers were in plush fur. Mac lay with him, not rising to eat or drink. She lay with him for hours and hours until sleep took her. She heard voices somewhere in her subconscious. Let her be. This came from Grizz. Is she okay? May's voice was colored with concern. She's finally going to be. And Lance? Cross asked. He will heal, Grizz said. It will only be hours now that he's shifted. Let's leave them. They have a lot of catching up to do. Chapter 19 Max stretched. Her fingers gripped thick fur. She opened her eyes slowly, still half asleep basking in that state of not quite awake. She was staring into a large bear's dark brown eyes. Mac blinked slowly. The bear's eyes glowed with a golden depth. Mac felt no fear. That was Lance's bear. You're better, she whispered. The bear made a low growly sound, then the creaking and the crunching sounds she knew. She closed her eyes. She couldn't watch it. She'd seen it before, and it weirded her out to see his features stretching and morphing. The fur slipped from beneath her fingertips. Hey. Lance. Her eyes flew open. Glad you're here, Lance ran his fingertips from the corner of her eye over her cheekbone down her jawline. I couldn't imagine anywhere else I'd be. And that was the god's honest truth. She couldn't imagine being anywhere else but by his side. I thought. She put a fingertip on his lips. I can't even begin to know what it's like to have a bear inside, to have another being that acts and thinks independently of you. He tilted his head, watching her. Mac chewed on her lip. But you stood by me during my mistrust and the darkest hours, when my own chamber of demons was threatening to bury me. Lance nodded. Then, I'm not going to Grizz's cousin. She studied his face. You're covered in blood. He licked his thumb, then brushed it across her other cheek. The finger he pulled back had a crimson tinge. You got some on you. I still have your clothes in the cottage. You didn't get rid of them? No. I could never. You can use the shower in the cottage. Chapter 20 Lance let the water run down his body, washing the scarlet remnants of the scuffle between him and Grizz and Cross away. He still hadn't fully absorbed the information Grizz had laid on him. He wasn't sure how much he would ever comprehend it. The only thing he knew was when push came to shove, he couldn't let Grizz hurt his brother. And given the chance, Cross ultimately didn't kill him. He'd sort the rest out while he was at Bear Canyon Mountain Range for the next year. He'd also have to talk to Mackenzie. He wasn't going to make another move in his life, not even the smallest one without her. If she'd have him. She seemed to have accepted him, at least as a friend. But what about the rest? She was the woman for him. She was the only one. If she wouldn't have him. God. He didn't even want to think of that. The air cooled. He'd been so caught up in his thoughts, he hadn't noticed. The shower curtain was pulled aside. With only a pair of panties on, she stood before him, topless. Creamy rose-tipped breasts, her hard nipples issued an invitation. Her hands rose, cupping, offering. Fuck. Damn. Lance's cock jerked to attention. His breathing turned into panting as desire coursed through his body, followed by electric surges of desire. Her hands lowered, tracing lips covered by the filmy white fabric of her panties. 
He stepped forward, put his finger on hers, and let her trail both their fingers over her sex. The heat contained within made his desire peak. She moved her hand, taking his with hers, up to the top of her panties and slipped her fingers inside, just barely passing the barrier of her waistband. Lance's fingers separated from hers and traveled down to her lips, to her pleasure core, then down to her entrance. He tugged, pulling Mackenzie under the running water with him. Her panties soaked clung to her skin, tantalizing, and at the same time, hiding what he wanted so damn badly. What he'd been without for so many years. Lance pushed gently on the fabric with a fingertip, watching it enter her body, watching his finger and the fabric making an indentation as it breached her entrance. Mackenzie put her free hand on his cock, wrapping firm fingers around it. His fucking body went weak and rigid with desire, at the same time. His other hand crept to his dick, joining hers. He poked his finger in deeper, wondering how much give her panties had, how far in he'd be able to push while the fabric was creating a barricade. Mackenzie moaned. A low sound that pulled at Lance and his bear. Her moan broke him. Fuck the panties. He shoved them aside, marveling at her dark pink skin, her sleekness. Mackenzie spread her legs and placed a hand on each side of her sex, pressing her flesh apart, giving him a better view of the area he wanted to sink into, to plunge into the depths of. Aching to be deep within her, he took her hand and pulled her closer, slipped a thumb into each side of her panties and pulled them down. He turned Mackenzie around and pressed her against the shower wall. Taking her hands, he placed them on the tile, held them in place with his. She pushed her ass backward, her body a siren's beckon. Lance reached around, tweaked and rolled each nipple. Fueled by her whimpers of pleasure, he positioned himself perfectly behind her, dropped his hand against her mound and ran it toward her clit. Mackenzie wriggled with pleasure at the pressure of his fingers on her core. She pushed backward, tempting his cock, almost taking him in, but he backed up. Not yet luscious, he whispered close to her ear. Lance. Now. Her voice was desperate. Please. Grabbing her hips, he drove into her with the fierceness of his emotions, his fears, his need. He drove into her channel, savoring the tautness of her body. The way it made a tight sheath that pulled him deeper, threatening to drain him prematurely. Lance pushed and pumped, taking, giving, driving, lost in the grip of her channel, unable to function or think of pleasing or pleasure, driven by the need to burst. With every one of Lance's thrusts, Mackenzie grunted and pushed against him, her backward thrusts wild matching his, her cries and moans loud. I want you to bond me. The words were ripped from her lungs, at the same moment an orgasm catapulted her body into a spasm. He wanted to more than anything. And the last time felt like it was more his idea than hers. You sure? Yes. God. Yes. Now. He didn't need to be told twice, nor did his bear. Lance bit into her neck, in the exact same spot as their first couple bond, but on the opposite side. He tasted her blood, the way he did the first time, but this time the surge of energy that flowed through him was like a fireball, traveling from one part of his body to another with a speed that made his head spin. Fuck. This bond. Their togetherness was double-sealed. He'd never let anyone or anything get between them. Especially not himself. She squirmed, let out a cry as she climaxed again. Out of control, Lance yanked her hips close and buried himself deep. He tried to stop the flow, but when she screamed and tightened in an orgasm, he fully lost the battle, matching her outcry, shuddering, filling her completely. Epilogue Max stirred. Something had awakened her. What was it? She heard the sound again. A phone vibrating. Lance's phone. He lunged for the nightstand. Sorry, I was hoping to keep from waking you. It's okay. His expression changed. She couldn't pin it. He swiped across the screen and put the phone to his ear. Judge? He paused then, what the hell do you mean AWOL? Judge? Judge? He glanced at the cell screen then set the phone down. Connection lost. I should call Cross. Thank you for listening. 
This has been a Shifters Forever Worlds book by L. Thorne. Stay tuned for more episodes. Don't forget to subscribe and to ring the bell to be notified of new releases.